I recently had the pleasure of going out to Scott City, Kansas, where there's a large buffalo herd out there that Richard and Susan run called Duff's Buffalo Ranch. It is a beautiful ranch right beside the highway. They actually do tours of the buffalo that you guys can enjoy yourself if you check out their website. Richard took me to some really cool places around Scott City, some miniature badlands, a little tiny museum that has some really cool artifacts located in an old church. There was just some really, really cool things that I think you guys are really gonna enjoy in this video. So thank you again to Duff's Ranch for having me out, and you guys sit down, strap in, and enjoy the interview. Susan and I have 200, we only have 280 acres on the north end of all of this. There's like 3,700 acres all together. And then we've, uh, our family has leased uh, this larger portion of the ranch for probably three decades, you think, honey? Yeah. At least, maybe more. We started in the 70s. It's hard to tell if they're all together. We still have a few cows that haven't had their calves yet. And some of them, you know, they're all different personalities of course some of them are nervous when they have their baby they don't want you to uh, go you know go come around and so they'll get together I call them the sewing circle you know the ones with the youngest calves they'll all gather together and then somebody gives the cue like let's get out of here and they'll all run off but these most of these have been around for a month or so and and they'll come to pick up to get cubes so but the younger ones sometimes aren't even with the group. If they've got young enough calves, they'll just go off by themselves and make a smaller herd, you know. Beautiful and, setting. Yeah, it is really beautiful out here. You can kind of see why he doesn't want it to oh, 100%. <laughs> be destroyed. It's just kind of a treasure. Yeah, it is. You get down in here, and for him, it's like you almost can't tell their civilization <laughs> anywhere around, you yeah. know pretty happy until we get them in the sort of. <laughs> Everybody thinks, oh, they look so docile, you know, and I'm like, yeah, but they're wild. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> We've got enough mature bulls. They start vying for the women, and they will get themselves filthy dirty, and they'll go out in the ponds and get all muddy, and then they go around and roar like lions, and, and they'll have some contests where they lock horns, but most of the time we don't have any injuries. But uh, they're just a whole lot more fun when it's during the rut. We've had such strange weather. See, he still hasn't gotten rid of all of his winter coats because we keep having these cold snaps. I'm staying here and she finally had to give up and stay with us because the calf wouldn't leave. <laughs> I don't tell this story very often because I don't want anyone to think these animals are clean, but years ago we had a bunch of cold cows. Some of them were bred and we'd take the cold cows to the feedlot so we could, you know, get them ready for to be butchered or sell them or whatever. And uh, we didn't want to kill a ba uh, mama with a baby so we'd let them calf out and then we'd bottle feed the babies. And we had a cow that had a calf and Richard 
Richard had me come over to distract the cow, you know. And my cousin, he was into the uh, Black Powder Club and rendezvous, and, you know, he did that kind of thing. And he said, if you ever get a keeper, you know, would you mind calling me? I, I'd love to have a baby buffalo. We said, okay, you know, it doesn't happen very often. But when I went to distract the cow, he went over and grabbed that little calf, and it started rubbing on him like a cat. And it was just a brand newborn baby. I said, oh, my gosh. We've got a keeper, so I kept it for a week until Johnny could come out from Denver to get it. And uh, it was so, I mean, it would actually have separation anxiety because it liked people so much. As soon as it, I came in there, it would rub on me and it wanted me to scratch his ears. And he was just sweet. That's really and, neat. Yeah, it is. And he, he didn't have a mean bone in his body. And so when Johnny came out, it was blizzarding. It was the middle of winter. And it was such a bad blizzard, he had a cage in the back of his pickup, and he said, man, I just hate to put him back there. And I said, well, he's pretty tame. <laughs> you might be able to have him in the cab with you. And he, he not only had him in the cab, he held him all the way home. <laughs> and they named him Stormy, and he ended up coming into their house. And I mean, he was just a great big pet. And when he was about 15 years old, they gave him to a petting zoo. He just learned how to open so many gates they couldn't have him there at the ranch anymore. <laughs> yeah, but he was, uh, he just passed away and his wife called me a couple of days ago and she was telling me that Stormy, they went to the petting zoo a few times and she said, yeah, those kids, those little kids could go right up to him still, you know, perfect strangers and pet him and scratch him and he loved it. <laughs> But I wouldn't recommend that <laughs> for any other animal. Yeah, we most of it's word of mouth, but we do have some brochures, some little flyers at the state park, and we pass them out to people. And we do have a website. It's um, it started out being duffmeats.com, so you can go there. But now it's duffsbuffaloranch.com. So uh, basically, the smaller tour tours up to five people. I mean, as many as we can sit on here and have me in the back. That's a sixty-dollar tour. But when we have to put the trailer on and load it with hay, that goes up the, to the larger tour, which is two fifty. And, um, you know, that's just, that's not per person, that's the whole tour. It takes about an hour, depending on where they are. And, you know, we load the people up, like I say, we put the hay bales out, and then we put these blankets over there, and, and we take this thing and we park it, you know, in proximity, just as close as we can without some of them coming up. Then we take that little silver pickup out and bring, you know, bring them in with the cubes and we take them all the way around. So they're really up close and personal, kind of like this. And uh, it's easier that way because with the trailers, you can't go through a ravine, obviously. So, yeah, and it's, it's an experience because you can see the land is just, it's beautiful. And they'll romp around and show off sometimes. <laughs> we had a tour this spring and, and I don't know why this bull was so so full of bin and bigger but he was he was prancing and he was jumping sideways and people don't realize how agile they are you know they can bound and then jump up in the air and just do a 180 just like that you know and they look so their bodies are kind of cumbersome you, you wouldn't expect them to be able to turn around like that but they are so athletic so those people got some really good videos because he was on display you know he's kind of showing off <laughs> well when we're all capped out we've got a little over 300 um, but you know it, it varies
had a, a bull born in 1994 on a pasture that we had west of here that had some white on him. When we weaned the calves, we brought him in, we pulled blood on that calf, we pulled uh, blood on his mother, and oddly, uh, um, she, that was the only calf she ever had. She oh, yeah, tore her diaphragm right, yeah. delivering that calf, and then she died of peritonitis. But we had to, we pulled blood on 13 herd bulls uh, to find out which bull had bred it, and we tested all of those, and they all tested pure. That was back at the time that they, the testing was not as minute. I mean, you know, they couldn't go to the degree that they do now. It was at the same time uh, of the O.J. Simpson trial. Because when I was talking to the guy at the, the lab in California, uh, I said, well, can you test the body? He said, yeah, we'll O.J. it. And I said, I wondered about that. He said, yeah, we're the ones that did the uh, O.J. Simpson blood for, the, uh, for that trial. That bull grew up. He wasn't, he wasn't very fertile, but eventually he did manage to breed a few animals. We were all excited in 94 when that bull was born, but it was the same year that Miracle was born. You know, the story of Miracle, the heifer. And Miracle was pure white. Miracle was a heifer. And so that was the big sacred thing to the Native Americans. So suddenly ours was like, <laughs> no big deal anymore. But uh, so it is a pure bison. Yeah. And well, it, is it an albino or is it lucid or? With, uh, this here? Oh, the one there. Lucism yeah, is what they call it. Yeah. None of them have pink eyes. They don't have the characteristics of a true albino, but they've got, you know, there's transparency in their hooves and in their, and their horns. horns yeah. But, and like I said, some of them are spotted. They've got some they dark on them. The pigmentation. And, yeah. and they just, they don't have the pigmentation in their skin. Right. So when they shed, instead of shedding and having the, the, the bare dark hide like these, they'll look really white or pink. I mean, you know, and they yeah. do, they look like they kind of have a little trouble with sunburn. Yeah. You know, the sun kind of works on them a little bit. Well, and, yeah, and all of the Native American history that he has studied, you know, in all the years, oh, yeah. he'd never noticed that the picture of Pretty Nose, she's Cheyenne, right? Yeah, Cheyenne. She's wearing a malted hide, you know, the, they called them malted hides. It's, it's got, you know, the, the white on it with the, it's a bison hide with white on it. So they, it happened back in the day, yeah, that too. that was taken back in the late 60s or early 70s, the picture of her. Yeah. And I'd seen the photograph, you know, and uh, she has the buffalo robe draped over and you can see where it goes over her wrist it's got white hair the uh, Lakota Sioux you know the the white buffalo is sacred and and to them you know after uh, after they were driven off the plains onto reservations the buffalo were killed off you know they were always looking for a sign and to me it's to me it's similar to things like in the Bible you know like prophetic signs like you see in Revelation, different things that are going to happen. And to me, it's a sign of the times. And, um, you know, it's like there were no white buffalo for all of those years. And then people started trying to breed, to reproduce the white buffalo. And then eventually, uh, you know, miracle appeared, just boom, you know, in, in 94. And then you started seeing different sightings of them around, you know. And, and uh, to me, the big thing is, it's, it's an important thing to the Native Americans, however they, however they appeared, however they got here, they got here. <laughs> I mean, yeah. unless you were intention, unless you were trying to crossbreed to reproduce them. People were trying to do that and then Miracle just appeared on her own. And then if I remember right, her, I can't remember, her mother uh, was struck by lightning. You know, it seemed like every time uh, that appears, uh, it, it's kind of a, uh, um, uh, I don't know, call it a dead end, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like appears for a moment and psh, it's gone. You know? This terrain is not what you would expect in Kansas. Oh, I know. You see there's an area there where there's some rocks around an area on kind of on the high point of that hill right there above those bushes uh -huh. that's one of the rifle pits there's one over there there's another one back over there near the yucca but so what is this here this is this is what they uh where the women and children hit out down here in this bottom but what what is it called it's called 
that a punished woman's fork. A friend of ours, and he, he's an artist, and he's also a Western historian, and he wanted to uh, check on when the last buffalo were seen in this area, and uh, he was checking on one of the adjacent counties to us, and uh, it he uh, had said that there was a, a guy that was working in the fields with a team of horses, and of course that would have been up on the high ground where it's just flat and you could see forever, you know. And all day while he was working, he kept seeing this dark object off in the distance, wondering what in the world it was. And uh, so he finished working for the day, took his horses and rode over there uh, to where he'd seen that thing. And uh, he said there was a great big buffalo bull standing in a lagoon over there. And he couldn't believe it. You know, I think this was, I, I'm not positive, but I think it was 1884, which, you know, the buffalo were getting, you know, even by... Even by 78, there were hardly any left here in this area. And uh, uh, anyway, he rode back to town, went to the bar, and told told the guys at the bar, he said, there's a buffalo bull out there. And they go, oh, you're crazy. There's no buffalo out here anymore. Everybody's just making fun of him. And he kept insisting. And so he finally got enough of them convinced to go out and look. So they saddled their horses, and they rode out. And sure enough, that big old buffalo bull was standing out there in that lagoon. And none of them could believe it. It's like, my gosh, there's still a buffalo here, you know? And he's telling me the story, and I'm just fascinated, intrigued by the story. And then he goes, and then they killed it. And I, I just, <laughs> I'm just like, oh my gosh. You're kidding. Yeah. I, I, I'm just like, I can't believe there's still one left. And, you know, it's just like their mentality was so warped, I guess, in that direction that that's, you know, what else do you do with it? Well, I mean, you would have thought somebody said, hey, well, why don't we try to put the pin or something? Wow. And they just shot it. This was the, one of the dwellings that they lived in. You know, they'd come in from the top and go down. They would have had like walls yeah, up like and you, then they would have had ladders, ladders going in. Ladders that go up and then holes that they came in from above. But this was one of the, uh, well, I guess probably the first place in this area at least where they had irrigation. Up there, and we drove past a, a building, the old steel home. I don't know if you noticed it, a stone building back here. Uh, but there's a big spring over there and they rerouted that water out of that spring all the way down here and had irrigated crops down here in these bottoms. There may have been as many as 3,000 Indians living in this valley at one time. What period would that have been? I suppose around the same time as this or before, I don't know. Because the, the Taos Indians came here, but the Plains Apache were already here. I think they just adopted some of the stuff. And I don't know, I'm so, well, obviously if some of that pottery that was found over there is as old as they think, the Plains Apache pottery. How old do you think they were saying that is? They were, they were speculating 5,000 years, but you know, who knows you get that far out. <laughs> right. It's pretty amazing. State of Kansas, where you would think is typically just flat and out here there are just these very unique features this right here just looks just like what you would see in the badlands i mean it is just a spitting image of it like a little tiny miniature version of it but it's not too miniature i mean it's it's fairly large all the cliff swallow nests up there? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I came here one time when I was a little kid. Uh, Where is this? Uh, this was, uh, I guess it was, I think it was called Keystone back then too. It was an old church. Yeah, see, they usually are at their house. When we open the door, buzzer goes off. 
over there so they know somebody's here. So we just go on in, start snooping around. Sure, it'll be over a little bit. Yep, there we go. Hi. Hey, how you doing? Hi, we just got back from collecting fossils. Oh, well, good. I'm, I'm glad we caught you. Yeah. This is Noah Gordon. How you doing? From uh, Barbara. Nice to meet you. Shelton. Uh, yeah, so Chuck actually found that one. Uh, it's a big side fact in this. I never quite feel right calling them dinosaurs because I think of a dinosaur as walking around on the ground. So they are not dinosaurs. Okay, but and what they, is the term? Uh, sea monsters. No. <laughs> well, yeah, they are sea monsters. That one's a sea monster for sure. Yeah, that's what it makes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So dinosaurs are dinosaurs. Uh -huh. And these are more aquatic creatures. They lived in the same time period. But they yeah. were technically they're not dinosaurs. And th these were basically like like killer whales are in the ocean today. Killer whales are mammals, so they the mammals came back into the water. And there were Plains Apache already living there by the lake. Are you and familiar with the lake up here? Hmm. But it's a it's a small lake, but you know, when the dam broke in the was it in the thirties? Oh. Yeah, think, probably. Mm -hmm. Uh they just found artifacts all over the place. So a lot of native people, you know, evidently settled along those creek beds, both sides. And how many different tribes have they found? When the, when the dam broke, there were artifacts in the bed of the river, just, you know, because they made it a lake by putting it in, in the dam, and they found artifacts all over the place. So periodically, you know, K-State will send a group out or different, you know, different historical groups will come out to, to do digs, you know, to find Native American artifacts, but there's a lot of stuff along there. And that's the creek that actually runs, well, west of here, it runs through here and then it actually goes right behind our house, but uh, yeah, so we find things once in a while. He gets mad when I find something. <laughs> okay, okay, cut that.